Father, we thank you for turning our minds toward spiritual values and direction through your word. We thank you for every opportunity we have to get to know you and your son Jesus through your word. We ask that this session would be profitable in such a way that it glorifies your son Jesus Christ and that it enhances our endurance in the spiritual life. And we pray this in the name of your son Jesus. Amen. We've covered uh, in Luke 8. I'm sorry, I didn't have you turn there, I guess. Go ahead and turn back to Luke chapter 8. Luke chapter 8. And we've covered uh, in the four sowings of seed. We've covered those in verse 12. Those beside the road are those who have heard. Then the devil comes and takes away the word from their heart so that they will not believe and be saved. Obviously unbelievers. Verse 13. Those on the rocky soil are those who, when they hear, receive the word with joy, and these have no firm root. They believe for a while and in time of temptation fall away. So apparently they did believe, and they even believed for a while, and we can assume that there was some endurance there for a while. But in a time of, of temptation, in other words, either the, the testing or the personal temptation became intense enough that they fell away. That is, they departed from the absolutes of God's word. Verse 14. The seed which fell among the thorns, these are the ones who have heard, and as they go on their way, they are choked with worries and riches and pleasures of this life and bring no fruit to maturity. It doesn't say that they were fruitless. Of course, this is regarding spiritual fruit. But they did not bring fruit to maturity. Why? Because they were spiritually choked. They were choked with worries and riches and pleasures of this life. This goes with what we just read from the Apostle Paul. No good soldier is going to entangle himself with the affairs of life. So they bring no fruit to maturity. Is it possible for believers to be entangled with the world and negative toward the spiritual life right up t until the time that they go to heaven? Of course it is. It happens all the time. That's why I, I love the fact that we're saved by grace. Saved by grace. Grace alone through faith alone. If you're watching by video, then if you don't know you're going to heaven, here's how you can know. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved. Christ died on the cross in your place. He paid your penalty and he is ready and available to save you without your having done any kind of works, without having any personal merit whatsoever, without any effort from you, he's ready to save you if you simply believe 
on the person of Jesus Christ. Believe on the one who died for your sins. Believe on Christ, the Son of God, and you'll be saved. Now, again, are there believers who are negative toward the spiritual life right upon the time, right until the time which they die? Of course there are. And that's why the New Testament epistles written to born-again believers contain so many warnings not to be entangled with or controlled by the world. Verse 15. But the seed and the good soil these are the ones who have heard the word in an honest and good heart and hold it fast and bear fruit with perseverance. The word translated perseverance is hupomone, abiding under, or endurance. And this verse in fact, this whole passage, uh, especially where we're headed, relates very much to the light versus dark issue in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14. And we're coming right up on that, but let's say one more thing regarding those in verse 15. They bear spiritual fruit through endurance. That is, they are winners. As the Apostle Paul used the athletic metaphor in Second Timothy chapter 2, which we read, and he uses that elsewhere. Well, these kind of believers in verse 15 are the winners of the great marathon which is the spiritual life. And they will be crowned with rewards. So, light and darkness. Let's look at verse 16. Now, no one after lighting a lamp covers it over with a container or puts it under a bed but he puts it on a lampstand so that those who come in may see the light. For nothing is hidden that will not become evident, nor any secret, nor anything secret that will not be known and come to light. Well, that uh, is very much related to what I read from 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 5. Let's look at it again, verses 16 and verse 17. Now, no one after lighting a lamp covers it over with a container or puts it under a bed, but he puts it on a lampstand so that those who come in may see the light for or because nothing is hidden that will not become evident, nor anything secret that will not be known and come to light. Now, it is very clear in the context and, in, in fact, the, verse 16 about the lighting a lamp and the lampstand in the context of verse 17, right after it, and the following verses, and the verses right before it, it's very clear that this is not an evangelistic likeness or illustration. Now, there is an, evangel an evangelistic illustration using the same metaphor in Matthew 5, verse 15, where uh, the Lord Jesus Christ did use that illustration as 
uh, making a point for believers should should shine the light of Christ to others. But this isn't evangelistic. This is written to believers or about believers with regard to what their souls do with the Word of God. That's the all-important thing for us as believers. We're saved, and we know it. But it is, it is of great importance what we do with the Word of God, how we listen to it, how we think about it in the spiritual warfare which encompasses us. It's all about control for the mind. The enemy of your soul wants to control your mind. And he does it through manipulation. He does it through propaganda. He does it through a world view, the development of a world view in the soul that is distorted, that is filled with error. In Romans 13, verse 12, here's a light verse. The night is almost gone and the day is near. Therefore, let us lay aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. The armor of light, that's the light emitted from the word of God, which protects your soul. That's the armor of light, the protective element of the word of God. And in order for it to work, you've got to put it on. In other words, you have to have it in your soul and you have to apply it. Is the spirit of this age wearing you down? It can do that to all of us. Is the spirit of this age alarming your soul? Is it upsetting? your soul, it will certainly do that. And we all are vulnerable to that. Is it saddening your soul? It certainly does that. The greatest of the prophets were very saddened by what was going on. Jeremiah, uh, Micah, which we're going to uh, go to if we have time here, which we should, uh, is the spirit of this age depressing your soul? That can happen. Is it causing anxiety? That can happen. Let's face it. We're believers in Christ. We're susceptible to depression and to anxiety. That's a, uh, these have been big problems in my life. Is the spirit of this age pressuring your soul? Of course it is. That's intentional. That's all intended by the enemy. We've covered the word that comes up quite a bit in the New Testament, eclipses. And it's often translated suffering or tribulation. The actual specific, the specific meaning of the word, I don't want to be redundant, the specific meaning of the word is pressure or pressing in. And then by extension, it does mean suffering or tribulation. But the enemy is pressing you in and pressing me in, attempting to, we're, we're freed by the word of God, so we don't have to, we don't have to be controlled by the pressure, but we know it's there. And furthermore, the world is very confused. 
and so can we be. And the minute we take our spiritual eyes off the eternal absolutes of the Word of God and uh, shut down our spiritual ears from hearing the Word of God as God intends to communicate it, then confusion sets in. And so does self-justification, self-righteousness, arrogance, a whole complex of mental, mental attitude sins. And they stay, they, they latch on and they'll stay with you for the, for the rest of your life if you let them. The enemy is very subtle. In 2 Corinthians chapter 11, we, we saw recently verses 14 and 15, Satan disguises himself as an angel of light, therefore it is not surprising that his servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness. The world's agenda is inducing a spiritual lockdown. It's coming down fast. It's coming down in layers. It is gripping the world in layers. And it is destroying liberty around the world. And what we have is great opportunity, number one, to be ambassadors for Christ and to get out the message of reconciliation to the lost, to publish and publicize the word of reconciliation, the uh, word of the cross, and to protect our own spiritual freedom with the armor of light. We have great opportunity for those two things. And they're connected. We can't possibly be effective witnesses for Christ if we're not operating in our spiritual freedom. Galatians 5 verse 1. It was for freedom. It was for the very principle of freedom that Christ set us free. So keep standing firm and do not be subject again to a yoke of bondage. Verse 18 of Luke chapter 8. So take care. This is a very key verse. So take care how you listen. For whoever has, to him more shall be given. And whoever does not have, even what he thinks he has, shall be taken away from him. We are the craftiest of crafty people with the Word of God sometimes. We all do it, but we are great in our arrogant self-righteousness, thinking we are right to think the way we think and to not really take care how we listen to the Word of God. Many believers are like lawyers doing research and they're trying to support their own world, their own world view. Instead of taking care how they listen. And if they're going to fulfill the spiritual life and not be disapproved at the judgment seat of Christ for believers, 
then this has got to stop. And I use that phrase because there's a great song just released. I think that's the name of the album, isn't it, Doug? This Has Got to Stop by Eric Clapton. The song is great. I haven't heard the, the album, but it's great. This Has Got to Stop. Verse 19. This is interesting. Christ wraps things up in verse 18. Verse 19, or maybe he didn't actually wrap things up. I guess he didn't because of what he said when someone pointed something out. Verse 19, and his mother and brothers came to him, and they were unable to get to him because of the crowd. And it was reported to him, your mother and your brothers are standing outside wishing to see you. But he answered and said to them, My mother and my brothers are those who hear the word of God and do it. What was he saying? Disrespect family members? No, he wasn't saying that, but he was saying that your relationship to the word of God and to the family of God, fellow believers in Christ is to be prioritized over all human relationships including your own family. Secondly, of course, we take the responsibility toward our families. We we have a natural love for our family members and we are to express that love, of course. All right, let's see what we've got left here. Uh, let's take a let's take a quick look at Gideon and Judges chapter six, where we closed off last time, then we're going to go into something else, a place we've been recently, but this uh, came to my mind in the wee hours, and I have to. I have to uh, express it. So Judges chapter 6. As was previously noted, the time of the Judges was a long period of time of spiritual darkness for Israel with a few intermittent flashes of light and, and some great things God did during those light times, but mostly very dark. Gene Cunningham, his conference is coming to Prescott, and in the Prescott uh, conference, we have the title, In the Time of the Judges, Lessons on Liberty in the time of tyranny. That's going to be October 29th through 31st, and uh, it's going to be the same place that it was last year. So we're going to pick it up from verse 22. This is the section where we left off. I, and by the way, I can't wait to see the what Gene has to say about this time period. It, uh, uh, I'm sure he's invested a lot of study in this. He always, his preparation is always fantastic. And I'm sure he'll bring out a lot of things, even about Gideon, that uh, I didn't know and certainly haven't touched on. In verse 22, When Gideon saw that he was the angel of the Lord, he said, Alas, O Lord God, for now I have seen the angel of the Lord of the Lord face to face. And what we apparently have here, this is debated, but uh, this was likely a what is called a Christophany, that is simply a, a pre-incarnate appearance of Christ, uh, like the Lord appeared to Abraham. In verse 23, the Lord said to him, 
Peace to you, do not fear, you shall not die. Then Gideon built an altar there to the Lord and named it The Lord is Peace. To this day, it is still in Ophrah of the Abiezrites. The Abiezrites were, remember, a, a family in the tribe of Manasseh. Verse 25, Now on the same night the Lord said to him, Take your father's bull and a second bull seven years old and pull down the altar of Baal, which belongs to your father, and cut down the Asherah that is beside it. And uh, these were poles dedicated to Asherah, otherwise known as Astarte, the uh, fertility goddess of the, the Canaanites and uh, Phoenicians. Take your father's bull and second uh, bull, seven years old, and pull down the altar of Baal, which belongs to your father, and cut down the Asherah that is beside it, and build an altar to the Lord your God on the top of this stronghold in an orderly manner, and take a second bull and offer a burnt offering with the wood of the Asherah, which you cut, uh, which you shall cut down. Verse 27. Then Gideon took ten men of his servants and did as the Lord had spoken to him. And because he was too afraid of his father's household and the men of the city to do it by day, he did it by night. So there you have it, as I pointed out the last study and have been recently. There's always the potential for family division. And we're to put our relationship with God above all human relationships. Gideon did. He just did it uh, in the middle of the night so that uh, uh, because he was afraid. And uh, we all know what it is to be afraid. Matthew 10, verse 34 through 36, Jesus said, Applying Micah 7, 6, Do not think that I came to bring peace on the earth. I did not come to bring peace but a sword, for I came to set a man against his father and a daughter against her mother and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and a man's enemies will be the members of his household. And of course, in, in God's sovereignty, he providentially allows Satan to divide families and communities and nations. But the source of it all really is Christ, who is the great divider. Because you're, you're either for Christ or you are against him. He who is not uh, for me is against me. Micah chapter 7. Turn there, since that's where the reference came from, and that is uh, where I was redirected and urged to say more about this. Micah chapter 7. We've been there, but we can always discover new things. I always do any portion of the Word of God that, that uh, I see repeatedly. Micah chapter 7. Micah lived and wrote in the last part of the 8th century B.C. Uh, he was on the timeline of Hosea, Isaiah, and Amos. Uh, I, he was right at that point with them. He was from the southern kingdom, but he prophesied toward both the southern kingdom of Judah and the northern kingdom of Israel, his approach was as tender as he could possibly be, but uh, realistic as well. He was a reporter, so to speak. He provided news and commentary, not his own commentary, but God's commentary. And his focus was on urban corruption in the cities of Samaria and in Jerusalem, 
and his name means who is Yahweh. In chapter 7, verse 1, Woe is me, for I am like the fruit pickers, like the grape gatherers. There is not a cluster of grapes to eat, or a first ripe fig which I crave. Woe is me. That's very up close and personal. It's coming right from Micah's soul. And he was overwhelmed by what was going on. And this is just like the Psalms of David, right from the soul, right from the human soul. Yes, expressing the thoughts of God under inspiration, but sometimes wailing from the human soul. Micah was grieved by the message he had to proclaim, as was Jeremiah. Micah would have rather complain, would have rather proclaimed a revival coming to the nation, but he had to do what he had to do. He used metaphors to express that Israel was unfruitful. Woe is me, for I am like the fruit pickers, the grape gatherers. There is not a cluster of grapes to eat or a first ripe fig which I crave. Not only was there a penalty in terms of, of famine present at, in places and, and on its way in a, a big way, but Israel was unfruitful, spiritually speaking. Verse 2, the godly, and that word, uh, kesed, that should be translated kind or gracious. The, the uh, kind person or gracious person, has perished from the land. And there is no upright person among men. All of them lie in wait for bloodshed. Each of them hunts the other with a net. The, the streets, you see, were filled with brutality and with violence. As our urban streets are. Not ours in Prescott Valley, but in in America. And in some places, it's absolutely horrible. No one is safe from it. Verse 3, concerning evil, both hands do it well. The prince asks, that is, the, the, the ruler the prince asks, also the judge, for a bribe. And a great man speaks the desire of his soul, so they weave it together. In application to us, all three branches of our government, the executive branch, which includes the Department of Justice, and the legislative branch, Congress, the House, and the Senate that make up Congress, and the judicial branch, there, and the bureaucracy of unelected officials underneath, the, the bureaucracy that lies beneath, that controls so much. And they get moved into these positions and have power that, that we can't even imagine. That's why these bills that, that are passed by Congress are so many pages long, and nobody reads them. And so they're all filled with corruption. 
the beginning of the verse concerning evil, both hands do it well. So you know, they're experts in evil. That's what that's saying. They they are experts and they do evil expertly. Flawlessly. They're they're flawless in evil. And a great man speaks the desire of his soul. What what is the desire of these people's soul? Power lust, approbation lust, money lust, sexual lust, all the lust patterns. So they weave it together. Conspiracy? Well, there was in Micah's day. Verse 4, the best of them is like a briar, the most upright like a thorn hedge. The day when you post your watchman, your punishment will come. Then their confusion will occur. Do not trust a neighbor. A neighbor. Do not have confidence in a friend from her who lies in your bosom. Guard your lips. There is spiritual warfare. I'm going to wrap it up, but I want to read one more thing from, uh, from J. Vernon McGee from you. But there has been spiritual warfare since the fall. It is intensifying. It will continue to do so. I wish that moth were not flying around, but it is. But I'm going to quit soon. There will be no improvement on the world's conditions until the Lord Jesus Christ comes back and solves the problems. Man will not solve the problems. Verse 6, for, some, for son treats the father contemptuously, daughter rises up against her mother, daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, a man's enemies are the men, are the men of his own household. I want to read something uh, J. Vernon McGee wrote. It was before 1978. I don't know how, how long before 1978, but it's a transcript of his uh, radio messages that was published in 1978. And so here's what he writes about this section. Notice this is, uh, notice this is exactly what the Lord said will come. And it had come in Micah's day also. When this sort of a situation arises, it is a day of decadence, a day of deterioration, a day of decay. It is a day that is very dark, by the way. We live in a day like that. This was 1978. This is like a... You almost got it. He wants to hang around you for some reason. <laughs> All right. This was 1978. This is kind of like an a fortiori type of thing. How much the more in 2001. But he wrote, uh, again, before 1978, it is a day that is very dark, by the way. We live in a day like that. We have gotten to the place where government is having to watch everything. But who is going to watch government? They need watching also. Whom can you trust? In whom can you believe today? We are living at a very sad time in the history of the world. This verse reveals the condition of the day when Micah was grieving his heart out. This is not something to boast of, not something to rejoice in. It is something to be deplored, something which should grieve your heart and my heart. I want to leave on an encouraging note. I'm just just one minute longer because we need encouragement here. I wanted to give more encouragement tonight, but I didn't get that far. But verse 7, the very next verse, But as for me, I will watch expectantly for the Lord. I will wait for the Lord or I will wait for the God of my salvation. My God will hear me. Micah had an expectation that the promises of the Lord to Israel and to him as an Israelite would be fulfilled. Our expectation 
is in 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 16 and 17, to be taken out of here by the Lord Jesus Christ, whom we shall meet in the clouds of the air. And we're to look forward to that as if it's going to happen before we clear the room, because it very well may. And that's how we're supposed to treat it. And we are, in verse 18 of that passage, to comfort one another with those words, to encourage one another with the words concerning that event. The snatching away of the body of Christ. 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 and 17. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 51. Let's close with prayer. Father, thank you for the time you've given us together. We thank you for the lamp unto our feet and the light unto our path that directs us and that gives us understanding in this time of darkness in the world. We thank you in the name of your Son, Jesus. Amen.